Welcome back to the reading series. We're doing chapter 5 of A Pure Theory of Law, the dynamic aspect of law. This is by far, I think, the longest chapter in the book, and as such, it's quite dense. But it's also important because this is the chapter where Kelsen speaks the most about the Grundnorm, or the basic norm, which is the idea that he's most famous for. So, there are a lot of details going on in this chapter, but I want to focus specifically on that, as that is what is most well known. So the question for the Grundnorm, the basic norm, is first, where does a normative order, where does it find its unity? How can we say that a body of norms fall together within one system, one coherent whole. And as you can guess, it's the basic norm or the Grund norm that ties it all together, that unifies the system. So the basic norm is what unifies a normative system. But in order to do so, it has to be valid. So why is it valid? Because whenever we talk about the validity of a norm or ask about the validity of a norm, we always do it with reference to another norm. It, we can always go hierarchically one up, one up, one up. But at some point we can't do that anymore, right? At some point we have to stop. And it is the basic norm, which is the one that allows us to stop. So how do we find this basic norm? Kelsen brings back this distinction between the static and the dynamic aspect of law. A static version of a basic norm would be to try and find something through reason. So, for example, that we should live in harmony with nature or through justice or something like that. So that the basic norm is a product of knowledge or reason but Kelsen rejects this idea. We cannot reason out what a basic norm is. It's not a product of reason. Rather, a basic norm has, in his language, a dynamic aspect. It means that it's a norm that exists only because it has norm-creating authority. And this is not a reasoned basis, but it's an act of will. Remember, we said that a basic norm always has to be presupposed. It's a sort of a fiction. As an act of will, it's not something that we can find through reason. It's just a, a moment. It's a fiat. It's the moment, do this because Father says so. So, a basic norm is the starting point that sets in motion a procedure that can run for centuries where norms continue to be created. And the end point of this procedure is coercion. And importantly, this would not be a positivist account if I didn't mention this, but the basic norm is never a transcendental justification. It's an imminent act originating in society, although perhaps fictionalized or presupposed. It's a moment in society where the major premise of a norm, of, of that norm, is not questioned. And then Carlson goes on to do thought experiments on the basic norm in different directions. So he asks, what happens in the case of a, a coup or a big change of government, a revolution? He says that the Grund norm doesn't change in that case. It remains valid. So perhaps the reason for the validity has changed. Think about the French Revolution. The, the people deciding on the norms have changed a lot that 
reason behind the Grund norm has changed, but the Grund norm still remains there. It still rests on an act of effective coercion, effective violence. And this is kind of the test for a basic norm. Is it effective? As long as a legal order in its whole remains effective within a society, we can presuppose the basic norm, the good norm, as being valid. So when no one follows your laws anymore, when it becomes mere words on paper, then the good norm itself kind of dissolves away. So this distinction between effectivity and validity remain important. He says that we cannot conflate them 100%. It's not the same thing, but without effectivity, without actual following of your norms, the validity of your legal order becomes questionable, but they're not exactly the same thing. And in this sense, you know, you often hear people say something like a constitution is the basic norm, but Carlson disagrees with this. He finds the basic norm rather in custom than in a constitution you know we had valid legal orders whichever country you're in there were probably quite a few constitutions already and people were following the law before the current constitution and the one before that so constitutions themselves are not necessarily the basic norm there's usually a, a custom that came well before that in the rest of the chapter, Kelson talks a lot about conflict of norms and the hierarchy of norms. And he makes the claim that laws or norms cannot contradict each other. Contradiction is a logical state, or a contradiction is a logical assertion. Laws themselves cannot contradict each other. Two contradictory or seemingly contradictory norms are either valid or invalid in relation to one another he says that true or false i think we saw that in chapter one already true or false is not a criteria by which we can measure norms we can only measure norms by valid or invalid and thus we don't have a problem if two norms contradict each other we have a few rules for that too for example a later norm trumps earlier norm or norms are in a hierarchical relationship to each other and the higher one in the hierarchy trumps the lower one this doesn't mean that the lower one or the earlier one is false or contradictory it's just that it's valid by itself but the later norm or the higher norm can make that one invalid and we find this hierarchy in norms because we use norms to make norms. Communication makes communication. Norms make norms. It's a kind of autopoetic statement, although Kelson wouldn't have known that. And he also says for this reason that we don't have gaps in the law. If we, The law is just the law. If we say that the law doesn't cover the situation, it's not a gap in the law. He says that is already a... A social or a political or a moral judgment that we make the law from its own perspective doesn't have gaps we might feel a political need to regulate something new that has arisen and then we make laws but that is a political need it's not a legal need the legal system itself is never there are never holes in the legal system from the point of view of the legal system maybe from the view of politics so we saw that it's not really a problem when norms clash or contradict. That's not really a problem. But what is possible are invalid norms. And Carlson names a few examples of this. He says that if we have a clash of norms, if a lower one clashes with a higher one, we can say that that lower one was perhaps never valid. So in that sense, we don't have a clash because the lower one was never valid to begin with. S 
so this Grundnorm kind of spreads its way down through the legal order down to the lowest level so even judges when they make decisions that's also an act of norm creation whether it's talking about the particular or the general norm it's still the judge creates a norm in that instance by drawing from the good norm when we make a contract that binds us we make a new norm between me and the contracting other contracting party that is also a norm creation relying on the basic norm because that contract can become the basis if it's not fulfilled for a sanction in a certain sense whenever we're dealing with each other legally we're always drawing a little bit of authority or validity from the existing grund norm even if it's found in custom so in summary we see that the grund norm the basic norm is a kind of a fictional presupposition of validity perhaps coming through custom and it's something that we don't remember maybe it's too long ago society has worked this way for very long but the point is is that it's effective it does influence how humans act it changes or structures our decision making paradigm and it does this by hierarchizing the normative order in which we find ourselves and we're always constantly borrowing a little bit from that basic norm in our dealings with one another so that's it for chapter 5 next episode we'll be talking about chapter 6 law in the state which you can guess is important for this hierarchy for the coercion and can i say the mediator between the basic norm and the general population also from here the chapters get shorter so things are where i i think we're over the peak of this mountain and it's going to be downhill from here but thank you very much and see you next time